Let's see how sensitive this, I'm gonna, looks like I'm a stupor this time. Hi there. I think we're gonna call this panel to order. Uh, welcome, my name is Joe Kantenbacher. I'm a PhD candidate in the Energy and Resources Group here on campus. Uh, and it is my honor to be moderator of this panel on behavior change, looking at how we can expire, inspire uh, change on the individual level. Is kind of an interesting juxtaposition of panels uh, in this particular slot over in the Stadium, of course, they're talking about California cap and trade, uh, this great uh, centralized government-derived market-based regulatory program to reduce uh, emissions. And without deriding in that particular program, I want to say emphatically that that's not the sort of approach that we're going to be discussing in this panel. Rather, we're interested in thinking about how we can lever leverage concepts like information, like individual incentives, like social context, to achieve various environmental benefits, including reductions in household electricity consumption, reductions in the toxicity of the goods that we consume, uh, increase in ridership of public transportation and bicycles. We have an outstanding panelist of people with a great deal of experience and have given a great deal of thought on how to motivate change. Um, I will say just the title for each uh, to get go. Uh, and then a little bit later, they're going to introduce themselves, give a little bit more of the background of how they've been involved with behavior change and sustainability. In no particular order, we have Andy Thornley, who is a transportation advocate and planner, uh, working with a number of different groups, including the SFMTA. Dara Rourke, uh, assistant professor in the Environmental Science Policy and Management Program here on Cal's campus. We have Josh Lick, Litch. Damn. Uh, I promised him I'd get it right, but I didn't. It's Litch, um, who works with OPower. And finally, we have Rick Diamond, staff scientist at LBNL. Rick's going to get us started off with a, a little bit of a presentation about behavior change and his accumulated wisdom about what we know about changing behavior. So, Rick, please. I'd like to start this as a conversation about behavior and behavior change. And to do this, I have a very simple exercise that I'm gonna ask you to do. It should just take a minute, but you have to be sitting next to someone or be able to talk to someone near you. So I want you to introduce yourself to a neighbor and in less than one minute, determine which of the two of you use more energy. And the catch is you can only ask three questions. So think for a second, what are the questions you want to ask, and then determine which of the two of you use the most energy. Now this can be done with just asking two questions, so I'm giving you a bonus question here. All right, let's go. One minute, who uses the most energy? Panel, you have to do this too. That could be three per person. Of course, total energy. Total energy. Okay, your time is up. 
Those of you just coming in looking confused, it'll all be made clear. All right, could I have your focus back up here? Does anyone want to volunteer one of the questions they asked? Anyone have a question they want to share? What did you ask? How many plane trips have you taken lately? Very good. Air travel just knocks us out. Okay, anyone else have a question to ask? Yes? Are you an omnivore? Very good. We'll talk about that. Yes? Yes, are you a vegetarian? Okay, did anyone ask the question, how much energy do you use? <laughs> right? This is not how we think. This is not how we talk. We don't have a vocabulary or even a... a a syntax or a taxonomy of talking about our energy use. I could ask you what's in your bank balance, you might know. I could ask you a lot of questions, but when something fundamental like how much energy do you use, do you use a lot or a little compared to what? Are you talking about transportation, food, energy, embodied energy? We don't know how to do it. So, right off, no one asked how much energy do you use. Was anyone able to pair off and find out who used more? Yeah, what was your conclusion? Who used more? Why? He flew 50,000 airline miles last year. Well, my three big questions, and this isn't based on careful research, would have started out with, are you vegetarian? Do you have children? So what's the policy in China? Right? How do you reduce energy use? Do you reduce children? I was thinking, you know, the other panel's cap and trade, but I thought maybe we could do carbon tax on children. And, no, seriously, and if they're vegetarian, you can have a, you know, a credit, and if they bike to school, you get a credit. So we don't think about energy this way. It's not, we just assume energy is floating out there as a given. All right, I want to talk about behavior. I want to talk about behavior change, how easy it is, and then we'll turn it over to the panel. Let's start with behavior. How many people here know what behavior is? Yes, instinctively, it is what we do. Can anyone define it for me? You're not going to like the standard definition. It's everything we think against. The standard definition of, of behavior is a reaction or action to a stimulus. It is nothing more than stimulus response. It is reducing us to automatons. But the definition goes a little further. The stimulus could be internal or external. It can be in response to an environment, culture, or climate. The response, the behavior can be conscious, unconscious, overt, covert. There's a lot of subtlety here, but it fundamentally comes down to something as simple as stimulus and response. So that's behavior. Let me just ask the question, and this isn't rhetorical. Uh, why should we care about behavior and the energy, in the energy world? For years we've been studying energy, in my area, energy in buildings. And the initial work in Scandinavia and Canada, behavior was irrelevant. We would look at energy use in housing, we could model it very simply, and we would get a very accurate representation. People, if they were even in the models, were nothing more than a 100-watt light bulb. That's what we are from an energy perspective, roughly a 100-watt light bulb. So in the 80s, people were looking at energy use in near-identical housing, and they were finding something very interesting. In New Jersey, suburban development, the same housing stock, two to one variation in energy use. Now, what could explain that? We all thought there were structural differences in the housing. So we measured them, measured their leakage, measured their insulation. The houses were nearly the same. The energy use factor of two difference. That's New Jersey, that's far away. When you look in California, in Northern California, we saw the variation in energy use in identical houses. This was public housing, five to one. And when we came to Oakland and looked at apartments, 300 apartments, all the same, variation in heating, 40 to 1, in electricity use, 20 to 1. Behavior matters in this domain. So that's why we, we have to talk about it. Let me go on. That's why behavior is important. Let me cover two other questions. So what do we know about what determines behavior? What are the standard models we have for understanding behavior? For the last 10,000 years, we've had basically four models. The first is what I call the deity model. Our behavior was determined by a deity or deities. That's how humans responded to all the unknowns and unpredictable nature of behavior. And that was our guiding model for 9,000 of those 10,000 years. Now, Age of Enlightenment, 18th century, we decided that there was reason 
There was new sciences like economics that could explain behavior, and that was by far the prevailing model, and as it is today. Now, it's been shaped primarily in the 20th century by psychology, physiology, a lot of uh, psychology, sociology, and many of the social sciences. And the breakthrough areas now are happening in biology. Um, here's a good read for you. Let me read the title so I get it right. Uh, Time, Love, and Memory, Jonathan Weiner. Anyone know this work? So he looks at the genetic basis for behavior and can tell, based on the genes, who has an internal alarm clock and will wake up, who needs to be prompted several times, how and why you will fall in love, how your memory is determined, short-term and long-term, and this is just genetically determined. Now, this book is about fruit flies, but the parallel to humans is very clear, and he makes the argument that you can look at the biological basis for behavior. Let me do a quick survey again. How many people here are very analytical, detail-focused, what we would say left brain? Put up your right hand if you're left brain. Okay, how many people look contextually, look at integration, look at what we call right brain activity? Anyone here, right brain? Good, good, good. Now, how many people have the corpus callosum connecting the two halves of their hemispheres? How are you both sides of their brain? Okay, good, good, good. So, the biological basis for behavior is fascinating. There's enormous literature. I'll just recommend one book here, The Master and His Emissary, Ian McGilchrist. He's basically looked at five, 600 studies on the biological basis of behavior. And if you want to know where the cutting edge is, that's the book to look. So the last point, what I want to talk about is how we change behavior. How many people think it is easy to change behavior? Oh, come on. How many people here are educators, right? How do we, how do we educate? We provide information. Now, is that going to change behavior? basic rule is you can't educate before you've engaged. So you have to engage the audience. We've been engaging you in this conversation. So educate, following engagement, and then guiding. Those are the, the sort of standard models. The last model I want to leave with here is the model for behavior change. And there are some competing models, but they generally are similar. The standard model looks something like this, and they're just three terms. Uh, the first one I'll give is the MAT model, and the second is the MAC model. The MAT model, M is for motivation. You don't see a change in an individual, in an institution or society unless there is motivation. The A is for ability. There has to be the ability to make the change. And the T is the trigger that prompts the change. So if you have M, A, and T in the standard change model, you can see a change occur. That one I find somewhat limiting. That's B.J. Fogg at Stanford, psychologist there. The one that I appreciate more is a psychological model called the MAC model. Again, motivation. The second is ability. And the third is culture or context. What is shaping, supporting, and continuing that change so it persists? So I think in our discussions today in transportation, in home energy, um, guidance, and in the um, area of, of labeling and information, we should be looking at these questions. What is the behavior we're trying to change and how do we best do it? And I'll just conclude there. Thank you. So with that, I would like to welcome the other three panelists to come up and give um, a brief description of, of their work and background in this area. So we'll start with Andy, if you please. I like that. I like that just fine. And I may not even need this mic, you'll find. I, I can speak to the people in the parking lot easily from here. Uh, I'm Andy Thornley. Um, I'm not a guy who thinks about things in energy terms as much as I think about transportation quite a bit and human transportation. And uh, you, you probably heard uh, or read, uh, I've spent a lot of my professional career promoting bicycling. I was a policy director at the San Francisco Bicycle Coalition for seven years. I'm now working with the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency uh, as part of their federally funded, internationally recognized SF Park pilot program, uh, testing out the theories of Dr. Donald Chup, the great UCLA academic, uh, who, very common sense fellow who said uh, we should not be uh, just putting parking out and pricing it at one price. We wouldn't do that with a bushel of apples. 
Uh, airlines don't do that. With airline seats, uh, we should be dynamically pricing parking according to the demand for it. But SF Park is more than that. It, uh, other uh, experiments in pricing and using uh, parking as an asset. The city of San Francisco has approximately 281,000 on-street parking spaces. That may shock you if you've tried to drive into San Francisco and find parking, and you think there are about 45 parking spaces. But we've got, uh, as I say, over a quarter million on-street publicly available parking spaces, and thousands and thousands more off-street in garages and lots and private. So there's lots and lots and lots of parking, so to speak. Um, the, the project that I'm starting to work on now, and, and just this week we had response from uh, organizations who want to participate in a pilot of car sharing where car share organizations will be able to use some of those on-street parking spaces for car share pods. Who's a car share member here? I'll bet there are some. Uh, I don't have to explain car share and the virtues of car share, although we probably hit on that a little bit later. Um, but the, the novel thing that we're going to be doing is uh, uh, permitting up to 900 of those on-street parking spaces to be car share pods. Uh, again, not new to San Francisco. Hoboken has done this. You may know about the corner car program in Hoboken, New Jersey, very successful. Um, but it's about uh, behavior change in a big way. Americans love cars, and we love to drive. And if we own a car, we tend to drive the car because it's sitting there. Uh, I just saw somebody going on about the dynamics of sunk cost. I bought a car, I ought to use a car, and I paid a lot for the car, so I should use the car a lot. Well, how can we help you not own a car or own as much car as you want? And that's uh, what I'm doing professionally these days. Um, but as somebody who's promoted everyday bicycling as something that anybody practically could do, I've spent a lot of time thinking about behavior and motivating people not to uh, renounce car ownership so much as feel invited and feel welcomed and feel motivated to maybe getting on a bike once in a while. And I'll give you a hint before I stop talking that uh, I'm no psychologist. I sort of left off on Freud, but I'm all about the id and about sex and greed and self-interest as great motivators. High-minded motivation goes only so far. Eat your spinach. I don't even respond to that. But a pretty girl in a sundress on a bike where is she going? Uh, and I'll, tell, I'll also say that you know the, the region is now flirting with bike share and bike share systems. We're doing it very small. It's, it's, it's very discouraging how small we're starting, but bike share, the, the notion of having just enough bike and not beating people over the head with it, but inviting them and saying, here's a bike. Would you like a bike? Here's a bike. So again, we'll, we'll touch on more of this as we go. That's probably more than you needed to know at this point. Let me catch up. All right, there we go. Um, so I'm Josh Litch. I work at Opower in the product marketing and strategy group. Um, I'm also a former Burke co-president, so really excited to be here on the other side of the table. Um, I love how Rick was being interactive, so I'm going to go out to you guys and ask a question. Um, some professors in Arizona went door to door and they hung door hangers on people's doors saying, you should save less energy because of three things. One, be a good citizen. Two, save money, uh, or three, help the environment. Who thinks the citizen approach worked? Who thinks the dollar approach worked best? Who thinks the environmental approach worked best? So it was a trick question. None of those approaches worked. None of them had any impact on people's behavior. The only thing that worked was a comparison to other people's neighbors. The fourth door hanger said, you use more energy than your neighbor. And AHA uh -huh, started Opower. Uh, in 2007, it, we started as a software company. We work with utilities to help engage customers about how they use energy. Um, our first product was essentially reports that we mailed to people. Um, it said, here's how much energy you used last month, and here's how much uh, energy your neighbors used. If you did better, you got a smiley face. Uh, if you didn't, you were incented to kind of do better in the future. Um, and this really interestingly has kind of universally worked. Uh, we, we're now piloting this in a lot of other countries, um, and across the world we've saved three terawatt hours of energy, which is enough to take Las Vegas off the grid for a year. Good so, idea. <laughs> so, and and uh, the product that I work on, 
uh, is called behavioral demand response. So this is taking what we did in monthly energy efficiency and then applying it just to peak times. Um, and how do we motivate customers to reduce their energy consumption during these peak times when it's most expensive and most dirty for the utility? Great. You're uh, not going to tell us first how you do it? <laughs> All right, we'll get back to that. Yeah, yeah, that's later. Suspense, please. <laughs> Uh, I'm Dara Rourke. I'm a professor here at UC Berkeley and also the co-founder of a project called Good Guide, which spun off the Berkeley campus, started as a research project, and now is a standalone for benefit. Um, and the idea of Good Guide really is to inform consumers and to see if we can provide the right information in the right form at the right moment in a consumer's decision-making process to actually change their behavior, to get them to switch products to more environmentally sound, healthier, nutritious, socially responsible products, and in turn to motivate behavior change among corporations, to get corporations to reformulate their products, change their supply chains, change their labor and environmental practices. And so we've been working over the last five or six years with this hypothesis of delivering information to consumers and trying to figure out uh, how we actually enable behavior change, empower them to make better decisions. And, and by that I mean both scientifically better, they find products that are scientifically better, but also that better match their own values and their own attitudes and their own beliefs. And I would just echo one of the things that Rick said is that providing scientific information alone clearly is not enough. So we have spent years delivering very detailed scientific information to consumers, and we find not only does it usually have no effect at all, but some types of information, particularly environmental information, the more consumers think a product is green, the less likely they are to buy it that it actually has a negative correlation. And this is some work that Avi Ringer, a PhD student, Esma and I have been doing recently. So just providing information, particularly information on how screwed we are on climate change, or how bad things are on biodiversity loss, or how horrible things are on toxics, uh, usually demotivate consumers and don't motivate behavior change towards the direction that we might want. Um, we've learned over the last few years that consumers are, uh, and people, us, you, me, individuals, um, are constrained by existing habits, by concerns around status, by peer influence, by looking at what others do, much more than they look at scientific information about climate change or these other environmental or social or health issues. Even issues related to their own health um, often get swamped by concerns for price and quality and status and how people think about me when I am wearing this or driving that. So, We've really been trying to figure out how do we connect this scientific information into the actual processes of the irrational decision making that most people go through when they make purchase decisions out in the market. And that is connecting it into social norms, into the context, uh, the culture, the kind of self perceptions, how they think of themselves, and then also to connect it to their social networks. People still look to friends and family for advice on what to buy, how to live, and so they're constantly looking to others and so we're trying to connect that in, also give them feedback loops, help them understand their decisions actually make a difference, that what they do matters, and show them that impact so that they get some positive feedback, and also invoking this constant comparison. People like you do this, very powerful from energy to water use to hotel towels, et cetera, et cetera. We also are, are really interested in moving from individual action, so Good Guide, um, the website, 25 million people have used goodguide.com to make purchasing decisions. We have iPhone, Android apps, million people have downloaded the iPhone app. But we're first trying to solve individual decisions, but then to move from individual decision making around products and purchases to solve that kind of individual action problem and then to move to collective action problems. We're really interested in, in helping people understand that they are, as individuals, not only consumers, but also citizens. And that there are things you can do to shift your purchases but there are also things you can do to shift policy. And so we're very interested in a strategy of behavior change that moves from individual action to an on-ramp towards collective action, towards political action around these big issues like climate change, biodiversity loss, that aren't easily solved by individual purchases, but that we feel, and I think we'll get into this in the conversation, that these types of tools can be a uh, an on-ramp rather than a dead end for driving broader changes, individual behavior changes to collective social behavior changes that can help solve some of our biggest, most intractable environmental and social problems. Wow. So I guess the first question that I want to ask and get a response to, and I think this has been touched on some, 
in your comments is, as you've developed and, and explored the issue of sustainability and behavior change, what's the biggest um, conception that you've had to shed about what drives behavior, what motivates behavior, how to affect environmental behavior? Hmm. I'll give a, an initial one because it's an, an obvious one. We're looking in the domain of how people decide to retrofit their homes. And at the Department of Energy, we do simple things. We give the information on the energy benefits and then the savings. And we say, this is cost effective. You should do it. That's the standard model. And what we find is that that's rarely the compelling model, but there's an interesting twist to it because that sounds sort of obvious. Before people make a decision related to their house, it's often about things that we were just saying, status, what your peers may think, comfort, and health. After you do the investment, you then cite the economic rationale. So people have this dual nature that they're motivated to do something because something intrinsic that is comfort, health, safety, security, sometimes curiosity. But afterwards, they'll rationalize it by giving an economic model. So rather than saying economics is not important, it is, we find it's often a, a post-justification uh, for the behavior. That's one of the things that we, we see that people have to shed. Yeah, and I'll pile on that. I'm the son of a traveling salesman. And he pointed out to me quite often, and he sold advertising. So we often looked at advertising. Uh, and when I was young, he said, uh, the folks who most often look at car ads are the people who just bought the car. Uh, they're not people shopping for the car, but they look at it to, to, to say, oh, yes, look, I did a very smart, responsible thing. Um, and I, I've seen that in myself. You may do that, too, not just car, but big purchases. Um, so validating and then also justifying. Um, and so I wouldn't say that I can't think of something that I've, I've had a, a sort of an epiphany or a change of outlook. I've been pretty cynical about human motivation for a long time. But in working with other folks who are promoting sustainable transportation, I'm struck by how many people are still selling bicycling or transit or walking uh, as a virtuous thing for the environment, um, social justice, climate change, all these sorts of things. Um, and it does help a little bit, but uh, talk to some folks in Copenhagen. Why do Copenhageners ride bikes so much? Uh, it turns out they don't care about the environment necessarily more than we do or any of these things. It's that it's cheap, it's predictable, uh, it's convenient. But then they brag to their friends, look at what a wonderful person I am. I'm saving the planet. So uh, again, I, I, I think uh, we're, we're, many of it, we're all saying more or less the same thing, that the appealing to virtue isn't necessarily profitable, but it does cinch the deal, that, that once you've got somebody on there, they, having them be able to brag about it is quite empowering. Yeah, I'd uh, add the misconception that we deal with is that money is what drives energy consumption. Um, there is a great study done at a utility in Florida uh, a few years ago, and they, the utility gave everybody smart thermostats, old, old school generation smart thermostats, and they thought that they'd help people save energy. Well, when they ran the study after the fact, they found out that on average, people's consumption had gone up 12%. They said, well, well why? And the reason is that people were essentially programming these thermostats to be on more often than they would if they didn't have a programmable thermostat. But when they went to survey the customers and they said, what do you like most about this program? Customers said, I like that my utility is helping me save energy and money. So there's just a total disconnect between what people think they're doing um, and, and the economically rational decision and then how they f kind of come out of a situation feeling. Yeah, for me, it actually, as, as an academic, um, it was pretty painful for me to realize how little information actually had an impact on people. Basically, my entire career is producing information on these key issues and delivering it through peer-reviewed journal articles, books, academic reports, even newspaper articles. It has, uh, that was pretty rough to learn. And also that how, uh, uh, and you know, the main strategy of NGOs, the main strategy of government agencies, it's either information or incentives. It turns out neither of these actually do much. Um, and that as we look at consumers, the thing we've been looking at, they're not rational. And this whole kind of Econ 101 is just wrong. People are not maximizing utility by analyzing the functional characteristics of these properties, trading off price, blah, blah, blah. They're just not. They're looking at, you know, I see that Josh is wearing a really cool shirt, and I want to be as cool as Josh, and I'm going to go buy a shirt like that. Like, that's, it's more that than it is a real analysis of these things. And that's pretty tough as a scientist whose work is to deliver this information out to consumers and to figure out how we participate in a process. And 
in our case, we're this little tiny group of scientists that's going up against literally tens of billions of dollars in marketing, which is all about emotional, resonant messages to convince people to consume in a certain way. And we're trying to say, well, actually, here's some facts that go against that. Think about this. And so I think we really have to change how we deliver our information so that it is effective in essentially competing with either the lack of information or the misinformation or these other dynamics which are driving actual behavior. So if we're not driven by rational considerations or information, which I think the, the record is pretty clear on, um, how do we achieve any kind of spillover effect in, in attempting to change behavior? How do we go beyond kind of one-off or piecemeal approaches to changing behavior? How can we uh, create a collective identity? It would be great if eating your spinach were the message and people decided that, yes, I'm a spinach eater. What else can I eat that's <laughs> spinachy? But that appears not to be the, the way of it. And you may be able to convince through the pretty girl in the sundress to, to ride the bike. But how does that translate into uh, other sustainable behaviors, how do we achieve that cascade or is that um, not the point? Interesting. I just throw out, I mean, there's some really interesting things going on in the UK with their behavioral sciences division in the UK government of trying to take some of the latest research from behavioral psychology, behavioral economics, even game mechanics, the kind of world of Silicon Valley, and apply it to policy and apply it to both to kind of default options, better defaults, so people don't have to think, and the, the default, the thing that they choose is the better option. And then also setting up policies in which you have to force people to make a decision, but with better information. So either smart defaults with opt-outs or forced decisions with good information, I think are ways you can apply some of the lessons of behavioral science to policy to scale some of these things. Um, I mean, the Obama administration announced a similar behavioral sciences unit, which Fox News immediately trashed and said this is the nanny state trying to manipulate us and control us. So there's pushback in the U.S. to bring this to our policymaking. But, you know, also, not only, not only are consumers irrational, but Congress is clearly <laughs> irrational and, and, and doesn't believe in science. So there's, there's real challenges, I think, in the U.S. on scaling anything that is scientific right now. Yeah. Uh, I'll pipe in a couple of things. I like the, the better defaults uh, frame. Um, we are always going to have to have public policy or common decisions shaping the environment. Uh, and so this on-street car share pilot is about making a better default that I can walk up my door and bump into a car share car and, oh, great, you know, path of least resistance. I'll sort of fall into sharing a car and then I'll realize maybe I don't need to own a car. Um, I, as I get older, I'm starting to conceptualize more in smaller units of, of society that, that I, as an individual or as in a team, can shape. Um, the nation is ungovernable. Uh, California, questionable. San Francisco, tiny city. Even San Francisco is a challenge to try to come together on some kind of a program and, and, and shape uh, our behavior. Uh, neighborhoods uh, are a unit that I'm, I'm realizing. It's obvious. You know that. You live in a neighborhood. Um, but I'm going back and reading a lot more of Donald Appleyard's work from about 40. 40 years ago, Englishmen who uh, uh, studied uh, the dynamics of streets and especially the threat of cars kind of corrupting and, and injuring the quality of life in, in those neighborhoods. And uh, a lot of the work that I do, the work that I did as a, as a, a hippie advocate and now the work that I do as a bureaucrat uh, is about policy and then getting the neighbors to go along with it. And having too big a group of neighbors to go along with it is a big, big challenge. And so uh, my notion of, of how do you make this stuff work beyond virtuous individuals or, or greedy individuals um, is, is be, be thinking about the mouthful that you can bite off. Uh, in Portland, uh, there are neighborhoods in Portland, Oregon that have exceptionally high rates of routine bicycling, but not the whole city of Portland. Southeast Portland, very high. Portland, all told, you know, not so bad. Um, in, in my small city of San Francisco, there are neighborhoods that are really uh, high achievers at that. And this is true probably with a lot of the behaviors that we want to uh, either uh, see more of or induce. Um, so I'll, maybe I'll throw that out there, that the neighborhood as a unit or some sort of a, a, a manageable unit of humanity 
uh, that you can have succeed, and then the neighbors get jealous. And then the neighbors say, oh, that's a cool neighborhood, or that's a cool group. The belonging and being like other people that we keep alluding to is very powerful. We're Americans, we're cowboys, we're individuals, we'd go our own way, except what, what are the rest of you doing? I, I don't want to be too different. And so to the extent that you can get some kind of a pattern going that other people would say, oh, look, uh, I want to be like them, and they're like me. Um, but that neighborhood thing, and maybe I'm just getting to be an old, grumpy neighborhood guy, um, but everybody has a neighborhood. Uh, and, and I think when I look at the Dutch and the Danes and how they operate, um, they're very much on that kind of human scale of here's a unit of humanity that I can work with. Cool. Uh, so one of the, as I mentioned, one of the new products that we have is called Behavioral Demand Response. So the way that works, we rolled it out with Baltimore Gas and Electric this summer, and it basically turns the entire city of Baltimore into a virtual peaking plant. So before an event, they send a bunch of messages to customers and they say, tomorrow's a peak day, um, please conserve energy. And then customer does a few things during the day to change their energy consumption, like delay their laundry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the following day, they get a feedback loop saying, this is how much you saved. Again, this is how much your neighbors saved. But one of the key things is how do you tie that to the broader impact? So we quantify at the end of the summer, essentially, collectively, your actions as the city of Baltimore uh, took X power plant offline or had this broad impact. So it's, it's kind of taking a two-pronged strategy. One, you reward the customer for taking their individual action, but you tie that individual action to really the collective impact. And we found in some customer research that that two-pronged motivation is really powerful. Joe, you asked the question how we can apply some of this knowledge in the policy arena. Um, it's a good question. It's a tough one. What I can share is how not to apply it in the policy arena just by sharing one recent um, anecdote that we had. Again, we have the opportunity to work with the U.S. Department of Energy. They're rolling out a home energy audit program. And one of the things they wanted to do was make it very simple, very cheap, um, very, very fast for the auditor, very not intrusive for the homeowner. And so their goal was to get the, the whole thing under an hour, not use the heavy, cumbersome blower door, the infrared camera, not have uh, all this work. And we did some research, we did some testing, we, we've been playing in this area for a while, and we found, yes, that makes for a fast audit, but there is no follow-up from a fast audit. What gets skin in the game is spending several hours at the house, walking the homeowner around with the thermal camera that they can see and touch, having the blower door be visceral. You can see the air going through. So we came back and determined, you know, really these audits should be costing not the $100 you're targeting, but the $400 and there should be the equipment. And it's the hand holding from the auditor that closes the deal, not the slick computer message. And so the way we went back to DOE, we said, well, let's just review your assumptions. And we said, you're assuming cheaper is better. Yes, yes. We're assuming less equipment's better. Yes, yes. And we went through the whole thing. And they said, so what's your point? And we said, well, our point is each of those assumptions is demonstrably false. And their reaction, predictable after the fact, was, please leave. This is our program. We're invested in this. We don't want to hear anyone tell us that our core assumptions are invalid. So this was, this was particularly challenging, and I shared this with Robert Cialdini, and he said he had had a similar experience. This is the, the psychologist who had done work um, behind OPower, where he had looked at the famous uh, Iron Eyes um, public service ad, the fellow who shed the tear after Americans litter, and he found, this is my recollection, in his research that Americans watching this video, I don't know if you all remember it, but it shows Americans throwing litter out of cars while the Native American is, is canoeing. And when he studied people who view this, they were somehow getting the message, well, Americans litter, that's what we do. And they weren't identifying with the Native American. And when he went and told the, the, the people who were promoting this ad, they said, no, it's our most popular ad. We don't want to hear anything negative about it. So again, even if we have information to share with policy people, we have to apply our own knowledge of how to communicate, which is not telling someone they are wrong, but engaging them on their own terms, working with them, and over time developing this awareness that perhaps what we're doing needs to be evaluated, tested, and revised. And I think that's an important message when we're talking about how we communicate. 
we could be as wrong as the people we're trying to change, and we need to understand that and evaluate it to make sure that we are reaching the audiences we're trying to reach. Let me throw a little pile on it really quickly. <clears throat> this notion of uh, going cheap and then failing versus going deep. Uh, the city of Portland and other cities, Australian cities have experimented here in the East Bay. Transform did some work with a program of travel choice, I think is what Transform called it. Um, some folks just don't know how to use transit. And, and these are very intelligent folks, uh, but you may be one of these people who said, if I said, you know, go catch a bus to Fremont, you'd say, I don't even know where to begin. And um, so carpet bombing the citizenry with information about how to ride transit uh, isn't as effective, it turns out, as first inviting folks who are interested in learning more. I say, would you like to have some options? They select themselves and say, I'll come and talk to you. I'll visit your home and I'll spend some time and I'll make up a custom uh, uh, menu and I'll, I'll actually take the bus schedule and I'll circle the bits and I'll show, walk you out to where the bus stop is. It seems very um, expensive and, and overkill, uh, but it can be very effective. Uh, but that starts with recognizing that you need to let people invite themselves in uh, and, and it's a false economy. That if you come at people with a whole lot of thin information, it may not be worth as much as if you come at a few people with deep information. If it's their idea, you can make it go someplace. Well, let's follow up on that idea and the notion of how intensely we need to focus on an individual and their needs and their belief structures in order to affect change. It seems like that's a very resource intensive way of getting, getting seeing benefits along whatever access you have. Does this need to spend hours with a person walking through their house or go to their house and walk through, uh, through the bus route with them? Does that indicate limits to how effective a behavior change program can be? Does that imply that on a, say, cost benefit analysis or other basis, it's, it's rarely a good idea? It's a big question. <laughs> I'll, I'll just volunteer a quick, quick uh, notion that uh, once you've got one of the neighbors or my family members on board, they become an advocate or an evangelist. And uh, in my lifetime, we've gone from scrap paper being something. When I was a little kid, we'd uh, collect newspapers in the garage and put twine around them. And once a year, there was a paper drive. And a semi-trailer would come and we'd drag a bunch of bundles of newspaper down. Now, recycling is routine and pervasive for the most part. We probably could do better. I'm sure we could. But um, the agents of change for routine, reflexive recycling of paper in particular are little kids. Little kids have become the cops in the house. And I don't have any kids in my house, but folks, uh, parents that I know say, yeah, uh, generationally, you know, dad goes to throw the newspaper in the garbage and the kid grabs dad and says, no, you mustn't do that. Uh, I don't want to encourage a bunch of little narcs in everyone's house. <laughs> But let's recognize that once you've got some agents who are either trusted or, or kind of uh, family nuisances or something, that can be quite powerful. So making an investment with the right folks, giving them, you know, taking up uh, their interest and, and, and honoring their, their curiosity or whatever. Um, children are wonderful tools to perpetuate uh, and very economical. So paper recycling, I've seen that success. So Rick's taxation on children may be counterproductive yeah, after maybe, all. Maybe, maybe, yeah. Be more nuanced with that. So I would just say, I think, again, depends what the behavior is you're trying to change. And so there are some behaviors in which I think you want basically invisible defaults, where you don't ask the person to even know they're changing. There are some in which you need to go in depth and engage them in a way that is very personal. And then I think Opower and Good Guide are really trying to do something that is utilizing the internet and the scalability of the internet, and we've seen this, the proliferation of behavior change apps, right? Health apps, personal goal apps, environmental apps that are really trying to see can we scale behavior change through the proliferation of simple tools that go through social networks and connect you to your friends, you're competing with your friends on whatever, how often you exercise or how many calories you eat, and, and there's a whole new world of attempting to scale this in new ways through technology, either directly to consumers or through B2B world, that I think is really very encouraging and has a lot of opportunity. But there are some areas where it's going to have to go, go in the home and help people understand things. Yeah, I mean, I think piling on there, you know, Opower takes a very similar approach. We're a software as a service company, and so everything we send um, is where we're moving more and more digitally uh, to send to customers. And so, 
you know, what we find is little tweaks to that messaging can motivate customers in different ways. So just over time, making small changes in the way that we message and segmenting customers to appeal to what works best for them is going to increase energy, uh, decrease their energy consumption. Um, and then we can take that model and scale it across a whole service territory for utility. Now, admittedly, we're not getting 50% energy change. We're getting 2 to 3% um, average reduction. But when you take that and you apply it over a whole utility, it's a pretty significant impact. Yeah, I guess part of the challenge here is that the question of information overload, if we, again, go back to a physiological model of behavior, our brains are designed to filter out information. They're not sponges. They're really set up neurally to shut out information, which we would not be able to function if we were processing all the, the information flow that we're bombarded with. So when we're trying to message and, and reach our audiences, I mean, this is a challenge I think particularly you both have addressed, what is the, how do you get through that filter? And then what is the role of feedback? People like to talk about competition and feedback. And the messaging seems mixed here. There, there's times where feedback works. Their audiences are receptive. Everyone loves the Prius model where you're getting feedback. Well, you're pretty captive in a car. Um, in a house or in an office, you're not, you can walk away from that information. You can choose to ignore it. So. Well, maybe I'm pulling you away from your questions, but I'm curious about how we deal with this question of feedback and when it's appropriate and how you formulate information that is useful to people. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so who out here remembers Microsoft Home or Google Power Meter? Ooh, yeah. yeah, not in the headlines, so yeah. this was uh, right when smart meters started being deployed. Google and Microsoft took the approach that if we just take all that information and we put everything about an energy uh, consumer's energy consumption on the web, They'll look at it, they'll care, they'll actively go there, and then they'll change their behavior. Totally untrue. Um, and both those companies shut down their, their projects. What Opower focused on is what are the two or three details um, that you have to give a customer in order to make them change their behavior. And what we did is we actually went, we recruited, our first recruits were from the credit card industry. The credit card industry is really good at knowing what two or three things get you to sign up for a credit card. And so we recruited all those people who had that expertise and said, instead of hawking credit cards, how about save people energy? And they're like, ooh, how much do you pay? But anyways, um, <laughs> they, we've, we've taken that model, um, and then we, we incorporate that, and we include just those details. One of the most powerful one, again, is the, the comparison to the neighbors, but we're finding other treatments that work um, just as well, and, and, and we continue to refine that and find different ways to give just that pointed feedback and relevant feedback. Yeah, I would just add, I think there are immense lessons to learn from the world of the internet and, you know, things that Amazon.com has been doing for years and years to basically tr compare us and our purchases and like products and, and then also the world of behavioral marketing and retargeting online where the internet knows an immense about us as individuals, our income, what magazines we subscribe to, our marital mm -hmm. status, our health issues, and they're able to target us in real time and then A-B test that targeting to figure out which messages work. Now, some of that is very nefarious and is largely going to get us to buy more or sign up for more credit cards. So how do we tap that in our policy? Right, so I think, I think, but there's, I think there's a lot to learn from that in that we don't have to continue to use the kind of traditional strategy that I'm gonna publish a report and hope everyone reads it, or I'm gonna publish raw data and hope everyone reads it. I'm gonna to target to different segments of the market different types of information in different forms at different moments in their decision making. We found also, so we rate 200,000 products in a dozen categories, and there are certain categories where people do pre-shopping research. They're researching before they shop. There's somewhere you do the research while you're in the aisles or making the decision. And then there's categories like cosmetics where you take them home and then you do the research to find out are they okay. And so some products, some categories, you research different ways, you need different information, different information resonates, and different types of people resonate with different information. We now have the tools to do that kind of delivery, which is way beyond what most academics, government agencies, or NGOs have done for the last 50 years on trying to convince us about environmental and social health issues, including all the work around behavior change with health through the 70s and 80s. So there's a lot more we can be doing that's much more sophisticated. I will say that one of the things we found is that the utilities in the states don't have a lot of experience communicating with customers in effective ways. They essentially see them as, as people who pay for their energy but not customers. When we went 
outside of the states and started talking to some of the unregulated competitive utilities, they had a much better grasp of how do you talk to a customer because they had a, an interest in keeping them with that utility because customers had the option to switch. So putting the incentives in, in the hands of the folks that are driving those decisions is really important. Yeah, and I, I don't have much to say to this except that that business I was describing before, travel choice, of someone coming and knocking on your door and saying, hey, can I help you move around uh, these days because of all the pervasive mobile computing, uh, the agency that I work for, the Municipal Transportation Agency, uh, has the opportunity to deliver that information uh, to, to its customers in a much more lightweight or much more effective way. The agency just redid its website, I don't think terribly successfully. I hope no one from marketing communications is here. Um, so we missed that opportunity, but public agencies like transit agencies, and especially like the MTA in San Francisco, who don't just run Muni, but are also in charge of uh, taxi, bicycle, pedestrian, safe streets, traffic calming. They're basically the streets agency, and they have all of that stuff uh, in their files and now on their hard drives. Uh, so it's, it's beyond uh, conceivable, it's, it's possible, it should be done, that we could help wire up some of the consumer pipes into the agencies that have this information. And don't let me be totally pessimistic. The MTA has done a pretty good job at sharing data. The city of San Francisco is doing a great job at, and there's a name for this movement, uh, public agencies sharing their data, uh, open data maybe is what we call it, uh, so that private application developers can develop apps to help you find a parking space or to help you understand how Muni uh, could get you there. So uh, these agencies have to overcome cultural problems with how they share with the public, but the data is there and it's really, we're right at a threshold or past that threshold of being able to wire up kind of consumer oriented access that's pushing that data to the folks who could really use it. I think the last area that I'd like to touch on before opening this for questions from the audience is uh, there's a criticism or a critique of, of environmental behavior change, which goes essentially that by telling people you know, to do their share, do their part, we're focusing on behavior of the individual and missing the forest, missing the fact that individual behavior is embedded within institutions and that treating people and their actions as one-off things rather than as a part of a larger system is, is missing a larger opportunity for engaging individuals in shifting some of the larger socio-technical system that's, that's heading in the wrong direction uh, in, a, in a more sustainable way. So I'm wondering what sort of linkages you see between individual action and larger systemic changes. Dara talked in his opening comments about engaging people as citizens. So if you have any thoughts about connections between individual actions and larger systemic cures, I'd love to hear them. We're doing a lot of work these days on institutional change, recognizing that Asking individuals to make the change is often difficult. They don't have the ability. And much of this work we're doing is with the public sector because, again, we're, as a national lab, doing work for, for federal agencies. So the, the clients who come to us are often um, Army, Navy groups that you don't normally think of in, in the behavior change arena, but they're acutely aware of the importance of energy reduction, and they do see the need for institutional change. And so we're, we're developing trying to develop a model that they can use to apply in many different circumstances. And, and we've got a very simple one right now. We're just calling the roles, rules, and tools, where we look to see in an institution, what are the roles that have decision-making authority that impact the behavior you're trying to change? Is it in the procurement of the materials? So the roles are clear. What are the rules? And by rules, we're looking both implicit and explicit rules. And then the tools are just the business processes or the institutional processes. And if you start mapping these out, you can see where are the opportunities and where are the roadblocks to making institutional change. They often jump in and say, tell us what to do. And, and we say, it's not a question of doing something. It's understanding the nature of the problem. And th these projects are nascent. We're just working now with both Navy and Army on some. But you can start seeing how getting at that level of institutional culture. And people say it's all command control. Well, it's not. There are a lot of independent agents making decisions. And you're trying to get them to see how their decision making advances the agency's mission and at the same time accomplishes the environmental or energy goals. 
So I think it's a challenging area, but we're, we're excited to be playing in that area. And I know businesses, of course, have been doing this for a long time as well. How many of you out there think that your utility, likely it's pg e makes more money the more energy that they sell? Nobody? Ooh, wow. <laughs> Informed crowd. Yeah. Uh, everybody's taking severance class. Um, so that's right. In California, utilities are what's called decoupled. I mean, they don't make more money for the more energy they sell. They make money based on how much trans transmission and distribution assets they have out there. But that's not true everywhere. In a lot of places, um, utilities are essentially incented to sell more energy, which just doesn't make sense. They don't have any incentive to help people reduce. And so one of the things OPower does is partner with regulators to help uh, set up the incentives for the large organizations and utilities to make sure that they don't have an incentive to sell more energy and, then, and therefore will help consumers save energy and save money. And so I think you know, working at the larger policy level is definitely part of our mission as well. So I would say, you know, just to expand a little, Joe, on your question, we've, we've heard many critiques of this idea of enabling individuals to make change. And it goes from the you know, understanding that the socio-technical systems around us limit our ability to make choices on transportation or home heating or uh, whatever. Um, and so there's only certain decisions. But then also all the way to kind of critiques of people, if you buy a Prius, then you, know, you think you're done and you've solved the problem and you're probably going to drive more with a smug look on your face as you're driving, right? And so, and then all these economists have said there's this kind of negative rebound effect of you take a little green action and you end up being worse for it, right? Um, I think there is a, a debate in the literature around that, and I think there's more research that needs to be done on it. We've seen, and people like Juliet Shore at Boston University have shown that many of these simple steps, beginning steps around thinking about your home energy use, thinking about bringing toxics into your house, thinking about how you eat, do you eat meat, how often you meet, often can be a first step towards thinking about broader issues. It's very, very hard. And we've found it almost impossible to explain issues like biodiversity loss or even climate change to average busy people, right? And so figuring out can you begin with these individual actions and then can you turn them into a process that, that moves you from thinking about, oh, I didn't know there were toxics in my home cleaning chemicals. Well, what else are there toxics in? And, and I don't want to just buy a different one, but I want to demand that they're out of all of these chemical products. And can you bring people along that path? And I think that there, there really is a huge opportunity for academics and NGOs to think about this process of moving from individual change where there is potential for real change. Where there isn't, where the system locks us in to a straitjacket where we can't really choose better options, then we have to go to systems change, right? And I think, again, there's places where you need nudges, there's places where you need good defaults, and places where you need consumers making active choices to drive signals in the marketplace. We found, and we, I think the research is pretty good, if you get to 3 to 5% of consumers making different choices, it can move an entire market. That you don't need 51%. You need three or four or five percent, and then the whole market shifts. We saw it in organic food, for instance, where the whole agribusiness had to basically respond to it. So you can start with small numbers and have big shifts from that. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure I have much to contribute. A lot of wise words here. Um, I'd just say that we're never going to get to the point where individual behavior is enough or even collective neighborhood, a, a good policy, and, and even some, some strong policy. Uh, in Amsterdam, the city decided eh, 35, 40 years ago as a basic policy that it should always be more convenient to get someplace by bike than by driving. And they didn't say we're going to outlaw cars, we're not going to confiscate your cars, we're not going to consciously vilify driving, but we're going to consciously be guided by making it, when, when we have a decision to make, that, that it'll be more convenient to get someplace by bike. Uh, having done that, you, you make an environment where individuals can say, ah, oh, good, now I have the choices, but you've really not only leveled the playing field, you've, you've distorted it quite a bit. Here in the U.S., decades ago, I was going to say a few years ago, but probably it's been 15 or 20 years, uh, tax policy has uh, made it attractive uh, for folks to buy effectively commercial vehicles for private use. Uh, and I despair when I walk around Bay Area cities and I see that most of the vehicles are multiple ton you know, SUVs and, and large trucks with you know, one person driving them. Uh, 
as an energy thing that's appalling, as a transportation thing that's appalling, as a public safety thing that's appalling, pardon me if you drive an SUV, but that, that really kind of is a, a policy uh, environment distortion that then the individual finds himself saying, ah, you know, why wouldn't I get a big safe vehicle? Safe for me, I'll kill other people, but whatever. And to the extent that the, the policy environment is, is, is set up that way, it's, it's hard to move around. So we're always going to have to have policy uh, uh, distortion, so to speak. In San Francisco and in the group, uh, the SF Park team that I work with, we are very much in a neoliberal posture. My friend Jason Henderson, the SF State professor, and you may know Professor Henderson, uh, uses the word neoliberal uh, kind of spitting out with contempt. Uh, so. Uh, sorry, Dr. Henderson, but uh, in the Bay Area, we are kind of neoliberals a lot of times, and that, by that I mean that we put policy out that lets the market pull things along, and I think we're hitting on this in a lot of what we're saying. So for instance, the car share pilot that we're working on now is about setting out opportunities for private organizations to come and take advantage of public parking spaces on the street. The city didn't say, oh, we are going to start a program and buy cars and put them out there and we're going to start a program to make it more difficult for you to drive. It was the city saying, we have an asset that we have control over, which is permitting use of the curb. And by setting up an entirely rules-based game and then setting that game out in front of private businesses, we say, go, uh, take this to your advantage. We're doing it as a pilot. We don't know how it's gonna go. It'll be a two-year pilot, and we'll see. And there'll be some crazy uh, damaging side effects, probably, but then there'll be some crazy wonderful benefits that we didn't expect. So this notion of taking your policy uh, to uh, uh, induce or shape or distort, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a place that a lot of Bay Area policy and a lot of US policy is at where as policy, we try to rearrange the public uh, domain so that private profit-driven interests can come in and have an outcome that's good for everybody. This is hopelessly naive. Uh, uh, my progressive friends, uh, and I have a progressive friend in my own head, would say, ah, uh, that corporate money is always going to lead you astray. Their interests are going to trump the common interest. And I don't think that's so. I think we live in, a, in, a, in an area, and San Francisco in particular, that was founded on speculation. We started with a gold rush. We've had a series of, of uh, waves of people who've come in to make a buck and get rich, and we're doing okay. So again, I'll give you that kind of contrary position that, that I don't want to see unfettered free market operations, but to the extent that we can sort of set up a playing field and let it go, there's a balance between policy and, and uh, private interest. I'm going to take a couple of questions um, that have been submitted electronically. Uh, first, we have from Santiago. How do you induce behavior change if it goes against an individual's beliefs? Mm. Can you? <laughs> how do you? Should you may be uh, another question. You? Well, so th there definitely are lots of techniques for uh, enforcing behavior change. So Rick at the start mentioned, you know, you can't educate unless you engage. First, we use a technique called grades uh, to engage people. And those can be punitive or they can be uh, incentives. Um, there's punishments, there's threats, there's, you know, uh, taxes. There's all sorts of things that can cause people to shift their behavior, even if they don't believe in shifting their behavior. So. You can use positive and negative types of uh, enablers or triggers uh, to activate behavior change. Yeah, I'll add that uh, at Opower, we, we did a study where we looked at uh, the energy savings of Republicans versus Democrats, and they were identical, which was surprising. The motivating trigger of just comparing to your neighbors is pretty universal country. Uh, demographic, uh, Republican, Democrat. So I think sometimes you don't need to change beliefs. Um, you just need to give the right nudge. Yeah, I wanted to just follow on that. In the model that I had of motivation, um, ability, and context, the motivation factor can be external as well as internal. Usually the internal is more successful, but we often see that people think the belief restricts the action. If you can get people to do the action, either they can change their belief or they don't 
they can handle the cognitive dissonance, but getting people just to take the step often is sufficient. So external motivation is, is, uh, does work. Yeah, and, and from my career in, in inviting people to get on a bike, many people believe, and not unreasonably, it's deadly dangerous to ride a bicycle in San Francisco. You may think that, and there's, as I say, some justification. Uh, so that's a very strong belief. How do you get someone past that and maybe get on a bike and ride to the grocery store? Well, I think you come at it with a bigger power, like the girl in the sundress, or something else that trumps that. And uh, I, I find it a very powerful evangelism tool to say, let's go for a ride. We're going to go get some ice cream. We're going to go uh, get coffee and, 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 and the, what we call rec rides, recreational rides, very powerful. But there's a, there's a massive belief obstacle there. That I'm certain I'm going to die if I ride a bike in San Francisco. And you have to honor that and say, I get where that comes from. It's possible that you would die. But let me give you something that could trump that. And, and honestly, we are all going to die, uh, uh, as, as uh, John Maynard Keynes said, in the long run, uh, we are all dead. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that's a very strong belief problem that, that you have to get a lot of people over. And, and also, you have to respect that people won't necessarily get past that. And you say, that's fine. I just, I'm happy that you would walk with me to the ice cream parlor. Well, speaking of things that people may not necessarily get past, uh, this question was for Dara from Alex, but I think the whole panel may have something to say. I love changing the defaults conceptually, but how do we navigate the political good gridlock to institute policy change? Yeah, obviously there's, I think, no potential at all for any change coming out of Washington, D.C. anytime soon. So I would basically say ignore Washington, D.C. completely. Um, and all the interesting action we see is happening at the state or local level or outside of the U.S. right now. And at the, this panel, this, this conference is mainly about climate change. The most interesting things are new networks of mayors, of governors, of states, of cities that are networking across countries to come up with new strategies of network governance that basically ignore Washington, D.C. and ignore the U.N., where we've seen basically no progress uh, at all in either place. So I would say just ignore them. Um, and I think there's a lot more potential at the neighborhood level and then connecting neighborhoods than there is doing anything through D.C. And it's not just because it's shut down. I mean, D.C. is completely dysfunctional, and even when it reopens, it'll continue to be dysfunctional, so I wouldn't put my energy there at all. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I would pile on that, that the neighborhood notion again. Uh, the, the exciting things that are happening in, in my part of the world and maybe in your part of the world, again, I, I'm very proud of the Bay Area has a heritage of neighbors getting together, and uh, it sounds a little Pollyanna, but um, really, don't wait, for, don't wait for the big guys to do it. Um, depending on the political machinery where you are or the, the, the subject matter you're working with, um, you will find that the electeds at a, at a local level are like you, like-minded. It's really exciting for me to be working inside city government in San Francisco with folks who I knew as uh, grassroots advocates uh, who went back to grad school and came in and now they're engineers and planners uh, and they're being elected to office. Um, and you could be one of those people, they could be your friends. So again, the neighborhood as a, as a workable module is, is always gonna be a great place to start. We were bumped a little bit late by the last panel, so we're gonna go to 10 of four, and that should give us plenty of time for a couple of questions I see people lined up already. Good. There you go. Sorry. I'm uh, Ruben Schwartz. I run the residential energy efficiency programs for the city of San Francisco, uh, which includes home retrofits. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, social norming is one of the ways to overcome the cognitive dissonance that was just mentioned a moment ago. And I think that's really important. I have a quick comment and then a question. I think that that social norming part is really, really not to be undersold. And that doesn't mean just comparing yourself to your neighbors. It means what is acceptable, what is mainstream, what is default, if you want to use the, the terms of behavioral um, 
psychology or behavioral economics. Um, and that can change. It's hard, but it can. I mean, look at, there are things that were very unacceptable to say not many years or generations ago um, that we say now. Conversely, there were things people said all the time back then that we would find extremely offensive today. You can look at lots of examples. You can look at social shifts that have happened relatively rapidly. Gay marriage is one that comes to mind. You know, huge change in a relatively short period of time. Um, it's hard for people to admit they're wrong, and when you change the social norms, it becomes easier. Because, oh look, I wasn't the only one who was wrong. I can change, look who else has done it. Um, that's a really important thing. And the one piece that I wanna take a little bit of issue is the idea of rational decision making. It's the wrong word for us to be using. The decisions that are people are making that are not economic are extremely rational. If I don't want to lose my friends, if I don't want to piss off my wife, if I don't want to lose the respect of my children, those are extremely rational decisions. Just because they're not economic doesn't mean they're not rational. And marketers and advertisers all over the world have recognized that and capitalized on that, and we need to too. So my question is, um, in terms of who we target first to start the social norming process, does it make sense to try to motivate people to change, or are we better off trying to target the people who are already motivated but are facing the obstacles, um, the social obstacles, the business structural policy obstacles? Well, I'll throw out a quick note while well, colleagues think. Uh, working on transportation land use policy, uh, in San Francisco, we say, hey, as a policy, if we change the zoning, if we change the parking limits, if we do various uh, controls, we can have a better society where people will behave differently. Um, what, what San Francisco has found in looking at the American Community Survey, the every year census data, uh, how, is, how are San Francisco uh, demographics changing as we change policies? Are people owning more cars, fewer cars, and so forth? And what we found in San Francisco is that where we've changed policy, the folks who've been living there all along, their behavior doesn't change so much. But the folks who are moving into those neighborhoods come to those neighborhoods because of those changed policies. And interestingly, Copenhagen has found this as well, that as they work on parking and transportation issues, they've seen that the neighbors who've been there for multiple generations uh, haven't really changed their behavior much. But folks coming to those neighborhoods come because the environment has changed. So that's something we're actually seeing and uh, I think that's either encouraging or discouraging, depending, depending on how you slice it. And if you're one of those people who's been living there for four or five generations, you'll say, damn it, you're screwing up my city. But um, uh, I, we're seeing this in, in real life. You, you, you change the playing field, and then in, people are invited in, for better or worse. All right, I think uh, we'll leave that answer there. And next question. Hi, uh, it's Tim Cronin. I'm a student at the law school here and a Burke member. Um, I sense a little bit of a, a paradox through the discussion. Um, it seemed like the comments on open government hinted at the, um, the opportunity for increasingly ubiquitous and open data to inform our energy use. And at the same time, we are hearing how humans instinctively will shield themselves from all this data. They, they don't want all these data points. And so it, it seems like um, you need intermediaries um, to sort of filter and present this information. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping, it, it sounds like Josh is somewhat you're doing at OPower is acting as one of these intermediaries. I was hoping you could expound on this um, or maybe provide more examples of how we can take a world that, where data is increasingly available um, and present it to people in a way that they can actually use it. I mean, I think technology, like, I think this point was made before, but uh, the advertisers are incredibly good at doing that, exactly that. It's A-B testing, it's, we, when we introduce a program at a utility, we introduce multiple different variations, and we don't come with assumptions about necessarily what will work. Um, in fact, often what we think will work is not what works, it's the opposite. And so it's using that data, especially on low cost, like digital channels, figuring out those two or three insights that are really gonna make a difference, um, and putting those front and center, and not, I think, definitely not making the assumption that people want more information. They want the right information. They want the information that'll make, help them make 
those changes. Um, and so, you know, I think big data, which is thrown around a lot, but the actual taking that big data and, and then crunching it into insights is kind of core to what we do. Well, hopefully we've given you some of the right information here in this panel. Uh, I think that's all the time we have. Let's oh. thank Rick, Andy, Josh, and Dara for their wonderful contribution. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, right, right there. Close. Um, so here's my question for you, Dad. Approach the bar. I'm going to approach the bar. I didn't get to ask my question. Yeah. But I, I, I like that you mentioned the Keep America Beautiful campaign, which. I'm old enough to remember that. That's the here, right? You know, so which the, my fervent discord about that is that that was funded by.